I would apologize for putting a little bit of uh, emphasis um, today, this morning, and this evening on camp. If if I thought an apology was necessary, <laughs> but uh, just we really want to highlight some of these things and be a blessing, uh, not only to our young people but also to you. And uh, but we are going to do things a little bit differently this year than I have done. In the past, if you remember, in the past, I, at the end of camp, I would have the young people come up and give a testimony, and um, I really felt like sometimes when they do that, it's almost a little bit of closure. Whew. Camp's done. I gave them a testimony. Move on with life. But that's not the point. The point is uh, for those decisions to be ongoing. And uh, so I, I might share in the message a little bit of some of those testimonies, um, but I wanted to highlight uh, some of the other stuff that took place and just let you know about some of the awards uh, that were received. And uh, so if I miss any of these awards, uh, young people, if you'll just let me know uh, if I missed any, and uh, that would be a help and a blessing. So first of all, uh, there was a competition for the choir. And uh, the majority of the young people that went were, were in that, that were able to, to be here and learn the song. And uh, they got first place in choir. So give them a good hand for that. That was a blessing. And uh, it was a blessing because I think there was, uh, I think, 12 or 14 people in our choir. The other two choirs had uh, close to 40. And, uh, but sometimes fewer is better. <laughs> Uh, then also we uh, they had competition uh, for singing, and uh, we had several that were that were singing. And Caitlin George took second place in the solo competition, and that's a blessing. Good job, <laughs> wherever wherever she is. And then also our our young men's quartet, or actually it was even there was five of them, so it wasn't a quartet. What do you call that? Uh, quintet. Yeah, quintet took. Second place in the group competition, that was Jackson and John and uh, Logan and Spencer and Caden sang, and they did a great job, took second place, so good job for them. And, uh, and then also um, uh, the ladies uh, quartet took first place in the group competition, so good job for them. And uh, you're going to get tired of clapping here in a minute. Um, and then also the other competition, there was the music competition. And um, uh, Savannah took first place. She's sick tonight, but Savannah took first place for their violin. And so that was a blessing. And uh, amen. And then also there was uh, a piano competition. And Mary Hitt took second place in the piano. And that was a blessing. And, uh, and Riley got first place in the piano competition. And so that was... You guys should not win so many awards. This is tiring. Um, and then also, uh, what else? Oh, the, uh, the preaching competition. The guys uh, did great in the preaching competition. And uh, Spencer and John, and they didn't place in the top three, but uh, they did a wonderful job in the preaching competition. And uh, there's ten young men that preached, and they did a wonderful job. They gave them seven minutes to preach. And so John's first statement to them was, I think it's doctrinally wrong to limit a preacher to seven minutes. Amen. Um, Amen. Which may be why he didn't place in the top three. <laughs> Seeing as he went beyond seven minutes. But according to him, the judges really needed what he was preaching. So, uh, so it, was, it was good. It was good. Had a great time. And it was a lot of fun. And the Lord... Uh, Really had good attitudes and good participation, and a good group of kids, and it was a blessing. And uh, just to kind, of, I just want to take a moment because uh, there needs to be um, uh, accountability, and there needs to be help. When we're talking about teaching not only young people, but anybody to serve Christ. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but it's not young people that they're not the only ones that struggle. <laughs> with day-to-day -day surrender to Christ. 100% complete surrender. The song does say, I surrender all. And, uh, and the preacher was very specific 
when he was talking about the word all. When he said, I surrender all, he actually wanted them to realize it meant, I surrender all. And uh, when he emphasized that, he began with this idea of, if you're going to have revival, which he said was normal Christianity. Revival is normal Christianity. It's just most of us are not living normally. Okay? Uh, revival is normal Christianity. In order to have revival, you must first be clean. You must first be clean. And then after being clean, you must then be surrendered. And then third, once you're surrendered, you must continue. And so if you'll take your Bibles, I want to look at just a couple passages. And this is away from what we normally do on Sunday night, but just to kind of give a help and accountability. And uh, uh, 1 John, 1 John uh, chapter 1 and verse number 9. And it gives us this promise. It says, uh, let's start in verse number 8. If we say we have no sin... 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8, and uh, give you a chance to get there. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see in that verse how the word sins there is plural. We are not confessing a body of sin. We are confessing sins. And the preacher was very adamant about God desires to deal with your sin specifically and individually. You know how he died for them? Specifically and individually. If not, he could, we would not be able to say... He died for your sin, and your sin, and your sin, and my sin. We just say He died for sin. He died. No, no, no. He died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. So He died for them specifically and individually. He died as them, specifically and individually. So how would He want us to deal with them? Specifically and individually. And the statement was made, and I think this is a pretty incredible statement. When we confess our sins, God says that He will cleanse us. Cleanse us from what? It tells us in the verse, from all unrighteousness. He says, after true confession, you can be as right with God as Jesus. Now imagine that statement. After true confession, you can be as right with God, and the chapter, in fact, will bear this out, because it talks about having fellowship. Having fellowship oh, with Christ, fellowship with the Father, fellowship one with another. After true confession. But the problem is, we have an unwillingness to deal with sin. We have an unwillingness to deal with sin and confess it. And forsake it. Okay? He who covereth his sin will not prosper. But he who confess and forsake his sin will find mercy. Okay? So there is a need for confessing sin. There is a need for dealing with sin. And uh, boy, you know, that's one of the things that it seems like we get young people together and we get uh, teenagers together. We really, you know, let them have it. Deal with your sin. Whether it was cheating or lying or stealing or thought life or activity, deal with your sin. Boy, we really pound him on that. And I was sitting back listening to the preaching and felt like the Lord was saying, deal with your sin. And sometimes we are not very good examples of what confession is. Even when we deal with our faults, with our family and our children, we love to put caveats in it, don't we? I know I shouldn't have yelled at you, but if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have yelled at you. Well, aren't you a grown-up? Okay, Dealing with sin 
means recognizing it as sin. Instead of simply comparing our sin to somebody else's sin and uh, coming to the conclusion that since our sin is not as bad as their sin, it shouldn't have to be dealt with as much. One of the young people made this testimony in, the, in our heart check time after the service. Uh, one of our younger, young people made this testimony. I didn't realize how bad sin was. Didn't realize how bad sin was. Boy, we spend a lot of time looking at the sin of others and like, well, I'm glad I don't have that sin. I'm glad I'm not a... Boy, we sound very like a Pharisee, don't we? Glad I don't have the sin like that publican over there. And this was the thought that we received. If the what we would deem egregious sins had never ever been committed, adultery, fornication, thievery, and robbing, and murder, if those sins had never ever been committed, and the only sins that had been committed were the sins that we've committed, Jesus would still have had to die. He would have still had to die. So our sin was the sin that placed Him on the cross. And so therefore, a recognition that God wants to deal not only with sins, specifically and individually, but our sin. Our sin. And if we can be as right with God as Jesus, what does that say about our desire when one of the things that we struggle with is confession of our sin? Confession of our sin. And so the first idea that was presented is you must deal with sin. How much of your sin do you need to deal with? All of it. Well, I might forget something. Do you think God can bring to your mind whatever He wants you to deal with? But He might bring something to my mind that happened a long time ago. Deal with it. He might bring something to my mind that might make life uncomfortable. Deal with it. He might bring something to my mind that might hinder my reputation. Deal with it. All right? Deal with it with those, especially if you sin against someone. Deal with it. Boy, it's a lot easier just to kind of put it in the background. This statement was made. No matter how long sin sits around, unforgiving sin still hinders fellowship. doesn't matter how long it sits around. I mean, in fact, in all of the world, you know things that sit around, they don't get better? They get worse. If your car breaks down and you're like, I'm not going to deal with it, and you leave it in your driveway, six months from now, is it easier or harder to deal with? Because the problems that broke down caused the car to break down initially, and I know, I'm very mechanically minded here. <laughs> the problems that caused the car to break down initially probably have now been compounded because you have not dealt with it. And if you continue to leave it there, and continue to leave it there, boy, it will never go away. Though it might eventually change forms, it will never go away. It must be dealt with. And just being honest with God, and how silly we are sometimes to hide our sin from God. Hide our sin from God. Boy, it just doesn't work. And so that was emphasized and emphasized and emphasized. You must deal with sin. You must deal with sin. I was amazed at some of our testimonies. We even had young people give these sort of testimonies. God dealt with my sin and my attitude towards my siblings. Wow. You mean when I don't treat my sibling right, that's still sin? Do you know that verse, let not the sun go down upon thy wrath, is not just for married couples? As we preach it to married couples. And fine, that applies. But it's not just to married couples. So how many times have siblings gone to bed angry at each other? You know what we call that? Sin. 
So very specific and very detailed. You must deal with sin. But with this promise that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, it is a good thing to be clean with God. It's a good thing to have your sins forgiven. And then what is the purpose? Look what it says in chapter 2 and verse number 1. My little children, these things have I written unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The preacher made this reference. He said a lot of times you'll read commentaries where it says here that this is talking about habitual sin. But that's not really what it's talking about. You know what it's talking about? I would have you sin not. Brother Omar preached on this Wednesday night. I don't want you, it is not God's will for you to sin. Ever. He said, yeah, but, but I'm human, I'm going to sin. The preacher gave this illustration. When you get on an airplane and they give you that little safety thing, you know, strap it on your kids before you strap it on yourself. You know, walk to the exit, make sure you, you know how to get off the plane. Those safety mechanisms are on the plane. But it is not the will of the pilot, nor the will of the pastors, passengers, that they be used. Nobody wants to use those. Now, if they have to be used, are they available? You bet they are. Thank goodness. But it's not the will of the pilot that they be used. Sometimes we are so naive to think that God is okay with sin, as long as it's not as bad as the next guy. It is God's will that we never sin. But if we sin, we have an advocate. Praise the Lord. And as the young people were realizing, I just don't feel I mm, view my sin as negatively as God does. And that is indicated by my inability to deal with my sin. Then there was a a message that made reference. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, I I was not in there for this message, but I thought it was a a neat concept. Kind of a neat concept. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. I was right in there for the beginning of the message, and the preacher asked about uh, the trichotomy of man. What What is the trichotomy of man? And he asked, and I I don't know if he thought he would get an answer, but somebody raised their hand, several people raised their hand, and they said, body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. You know, whenever I talk about the makeup of man, that's the way I give it. Man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. A saved man. Body, soul, and spirit. That's the way I always heard it. That's the way I always give it. It's interesting, in verse number 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I'm telling you, this was a concept that was just, we think body, soul, spirit. You know how the Bible operates? Spirit, soul, body. Boy, we think opposite. You know, when we have our trouble, our first trouble is in the body. And then it becomes emotional. And these three terms, you can, you can look them up. These three terms are so interwoven that they're very difficult to strip apart. In fact, several places, the word that is used for spirit is very similar to the word that is used for soul. But when you look at it, can I tell you, there's, there's a big difference between living your life body, soul, spirit than living your life spirit, soul, body. Making everything first, is it right in the spirit? And my spirit that determines my emotion about it. And my emotion determ- and then my spirit determines my emotion and then therefore that will determine my activity. Boy, if young people could get a hold of that, what a difference it would make in your life. 
Isn't that what happens when something wrong happens in our life? The very first thing we do is react, do something, get mad about it, and then eventually pray. We're like, Ur! we'll throw something, get angry, and then we'll pray. Because that is the process by which we live our life. Body, soul, spirit. Body, soul, spirit. Body, soul, spirit. That's backwards. It's backwards. We should be spirit first. And let the Word of God as it feeds our spirit determine our emotion. You ever wonder how come Paul and Silas could be singing in the prison? How is it possible to be singing in the prison? Well, this is why. Spirit, soul, body. If body was first, friend, you would not be singing. They are in stocks. They are bound. There are no doubt creepy crawlies in that place. It is not a happy place. It is a yucky place. And besides that, you have taken your liberty away from you. Emotionally, it's a bad place to be. And then you say, man, I don't want, what's the use in the Spirit? But here we see Paul and Silas, what are they doing? Singing and praising God. How is that possible? Well, were they in the will of God? Most certainly they were. Were they suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ? Most, suffering, or most certainly they were. So in the sense of the Spirit, they were exactly where they were supposed to be. So their Spirit determined their emotion, determined how they were going to reference the condition of their body. And how important that is in the thought. And then in the verse, it says this, to sanctify, the God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray that your God of your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're talking about preservation. We're talking about sanctification. Can I tell you, even the preachers, you know what they deal with sanctification first? In the body. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And then when we're done with that, we're saying, stop feeling that way. Stop feeling that way. And then finally we get to, oh yeah, and make sure you, you know, do spiritual stuff too. That's backwards. That is 100% backwards. The very first step is to be nourished in the Spirit. No wonder we end up doing so much in the flesh. No wonder verses like, Rejoice in the Lord always makes no sense to us. Be anxious for nothing makes absolutely no sense to us. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, it doesn't make sense to us. You know why? Because we are consumed first with, well, how does that make me feel? Well, what am I going to do next? How am I going to deal with this? Where the very first uh, thing that we're talking about being preserved is the spirit first, then the soul, then the body. Boy, I've met people that seem to have this down. You ever met somebody that was dealing with an illness and the very reality of the frailty of their body demanded that they put spirit first? It demanded it. They really had no choice. Their body was already broken. And so it demanded that, and when they put spirit first, it's amazing how they're okay. How can you be okay with this? Well, what else am I supposed to be? What other choice do I have? Right? And we understand that when somebody is so frail of body that it seems like they don't have the strength. It's those of us that don't have that frailty that get it backwards and put body first and emotion first and spirit first. Have you ever had an argument, a discussion with your wife that went this way? Spirit, soul, body. Hmm, that would be tough. It'd be tough to argue in the spirit. But it sure is easy to argue in the soul. And it's really easy to argue in the body. So we argue in the body, we argue in the soul, and the spirit's just going to have to sit out that one. So the responsibility that we have as believers is to how often are we to be following Christ? How often are we to be glorifying Christ in our attitude, in our actions, and, and the things that we do? We're supposed to be glorifying Christ 
every moment of every day. How do I do that? Well, I got to lift up Christ. Believe what he says. Believe that his word is true. This reference was made to salvation. You know how, how come I know I'm saved? Because I'm a good person. No. No. I know I'm saved because I'm a preacher. No. No. You know why I know I'm saved? Because I believe what the Word of God says. God said He died for me. He gave His blood for me. And according to the Scriptures, I place my dependency upon Christ for my salvation. And all of us that are saved go, Amen. Amen. Then how come I can't live for Him the same way? Boy, it's amazing when trouble comes. I always love doing watching this at camp. You see a kid go forward and he's crying, getting right with God and wants to serve God and the next day he's on the ball field. We observed this a little bit. The next day he's on the ball field. And here you have an opportunity to take some tactical advantage, otherwise known as cheating. And you watch that same kid that poured his heart out to God the night before go, <gasps> cheat. How is that possible? Because in order to have our heart and life right with God, there must be a dedication moment by moment to serving the Lord. There must be a dedication to go, my life is not my own, it is the Lord, so therefore I must glorify God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind. Can't take a day off. Can't take an hour off. And there's a diligence that goes a diligence that goes into it. We were referenced at camp another another uh, passage, and that was we don't need to turn there of the life of Samson. The life of Samson. Boy, can you see Samson sitting there being made fun of as he's bound by his sin? His eyes have been plucked out. He has nothing. No strength at all. And he says, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. We look at Samson and we go, man, what a sad, sad story. But the sadness of Samson was not his physical strength. You know the sad part about Samson's story? The Bible says, and he wished not that the Spirit of God left him. You know when he lost his strength? It wasn't when he lost his eyes. It wasn't when he was bound. It wasn't when he was grinding grain. It's when the Spirit of God left him. That's when he lost his strength. And he lost the Spirit of God simply because he pursued body first, soul first, and didn't even realize the Spirit of God had left him. I wonder how many times the Lord looks down at us and says, Oh, so weak. So weak. They don't even have the Spirit of God. They don't even have the strength that is available to them. But we're walking around pursuing pleasures of this world completely oblivious that we've lost power with God. Completely oblivious. There's no confession of sin. There's no pursuit from God. There's no pursuit of those things. And we find ourselves all of a sudden being taken captive. I, in my short a time in the ministry, I have already heard more times than I can count I didn't mean for this to happen. I didn't mean for this to happen. Pastor, how could this have happened to my kids? Man, I've already heard it so many times. Because we are so naive to think God is okay with 50% or 60% or 70% surrender. You know how much he wants? 100%. But preacher, I can't do that. Well, then you better cry out to God and confess your sins. How often? Every time you sin. Every time you sin. I think of this illustration. In the temple, you know they made sacrifices every single day? And they would go into the holy place and the most holy place once a year, but they'd go into the holy place Every single day they'd go in the holy place. 
in the holy place was the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the menorah, the candlestick. They would go in and they would prepare the, the bread, they would keep the incense burning, and they would continue to trim uh, the, uh, the wick of the candlestick. Every single day they would do that. And the representation is pretty simple. The table of showbread, that bread represents nourishing from the Word of God. The altar of incense represents the prayers that went to God. That candlestick, that menorah represents the relationship between God and man. Every single day they did that. Without fail. When they were being obedient to God. But you know what they did before they ever went into the holy place? They would go to the laver. And they'd wash their hands and wash their feet. Do you know what would happen if they went into the holy place without visiting the laver? It would not be a good thing. Defilement. Defilement. The laver represents our cleansing of our hands and the cleansing of our feet, the cleansing of our sin before God. If I were to get anything from what the kids learned at camp, the first thing was this. My walk with the Lord is not what I thought it was. You hear the testimony over and over again. My walk with the Lord is not what I thought it was. I was just kind of going through the motions. God wants to have a relationship with me. How often? Every single day. But He is unwilling to fellowship with that which is unclean. Do we take our fellowship with God seriously? Do we take our relationship with God seriously? Are we just simply Sunday Christians or Wednesday Christians? Are Christians in culture? Or do we pour out our heart to God and say, God, I'm a wicked sinner. I know You saved my soul, but I need cleansing. I need forgiveness. I want to know Your presence. I want to know that You're there. On the last day of camp, the message was preached on how to continue with your decision. The story of Elijah was used. Remember the story of Elijah when his servant came in and he looked around he saw the Assyrian army? And he said, man, this is hopeless. There's no way we can do it. And Elijah said, I pray, Lord, that You would open his eyes. He opened his eyes and he saw those angels and chariots of fire. And Elijah made this statement. There be more of us than there are of they. You can do it in the power of God. And sometimes I really believe that we are not diligent with our life. Not diligent with our surrender to the Lord. I'll give you this confession. The Lord uses this to just kind of hit me across the face. Brother John and I were in Minnesota a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and I, I told this in, in Sunday school a couple weeks ago. Brother John, John and I were in Minnesota. And we were there for a purpose. Encourage Brother Hoyseth. Check on the church. See how things were going. And to be an encouragement. And do whatever we could to fire up the, the people and the church and the town. We, whatever we could. Man, every single day I went out, there was a solid purpose. Track in my pocket, ready to go. It didn't matter if it was a storekeeper, a waitress, somebody we met on the street. We'd tell them, hey, can I tell you about Northwoods Baptist Church? And so we went door knocking uh, for, for long durations. And man, we we're excited. Man, this is awesome. Telling them people about the church. I, I, was, I was genuinely excited and thrilled. And I made this statement to Brother John. And I said, uh, man... Sometimes it feels like it's easier to witness when you're away from home. I put it in the form of a question, which I should not have done. I said, don't you feel like it's easier to, to witness and be excited about, you know, the church and, the, and, and these things when you're away from home? And you know what he said to me? No. I do this at home too. And I just wanted to let him have it. You know, just 
gave him a good one. Body first, man. Body first right there. You know what it is? It's awful easy to get lackadaisical about your relationship and your service to Christ. And here's why it's comfortable. We don't view that as sin. We don't view it as sin. It's awful easy to get lazy in our, in our diligence, in our dependence upon the Word of God, in our dependence in prayer. It's awful easy, but we don't view it as sin. We go, hey, I'm not a bad person. Hey, at least I'm, at least I'm doing all this other stuff. Friend, when the Lord convicts you, can I tell you what it is? Sin. The Lord doesn't convict you about righteousness. He convicts you about sin. And how the Lord had to do work on me and say, listen, it doesn't matter if what you do that is wrong is done out of deceit, done intentionally, or done out of laziness, or done out of unintention, or oops, I didn't mean to. It doesn't matter. It's still sin. Still sin. The consequences may be worse on some than others, but it's still sin. Listen, if you get into an accident on the way home tonight, it may be true that the consequences will be different if you purposely target somebody's car and put a sign out, I'm going to run into you. The consequences could be more severe. But can I tell you, if you run into somebody out of a complete accident, can I tell you there's still damage? They're still hurt. And sometimes I really feel like we're living our life by accident. Just going through the day, hope we don't run into anybody. Instead of saying, God, I am yours. This life is your life. I want to confess my sin. I want to surrender my life. And I want to be used for your glory. We tell the young people, give God your life. Give God, give God your life. Can I tell you it's a message for old people too? Respectfully. It's a message for old people. Give God your life. Because God, when He's done with you, He'll take you home. Until He takes you home, He wants all of you for His glory. What do we put first? If you hit... The preacher hit on this. If you hit snooze in the morning when God tells you you should get up, you probably put body first instead of spirit. If your first reaction is anger, you probably put body or soul first before spirit. And there's probably not a preparation. God, I purposely, on purpose, intentionally put you first today. May you be glorified. I encourage you to pray for the young people as they, I, this is what I told them. We're not going to give your testimonies in church. I want the people of church to watch you and go, wow, they're different. Something's changed in their life because that's truly giving God glory. And may God receive glory not only in their life, but in ours also. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Or just different kind of message tonight, Lord. Just want to share the, the burden and the activity that took place there at camp, Lord, for accountability. Lord, the, the questions that could be asked, Lord, have we dealt with our sin? Is there yet sin that you have revealed to us, that you've convicted us about it, and we have not let it go? We have not surrendered it to you. We have not sought cleansing. We have not forsaken it. Lord, I thank you that your promises are that you will cleanse it. Lord, and once we deal with the sin, Lord, I pray that you help us to deal with the necessity of surrender. 100% surrender. Giving you our life. Giving you our occupation, our family, our marriage, our home, our children, our free time, our entertainment, our hobbies. Giving you everything. Lord, may we trust You that we can continue. You have given us Your Holy Spirit. You have given us Your Word. And Your desire is that we sin not. 
Lord, and help us to keep that short leash, confessing our sin. Lord, what a difference it would make in the life of believers if they simply lived their life on purpose. Intentionally putting you first, moment by moment. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand.